Okay, so we're doing uh, vectors in 12.2. Um, I think most of you guys know the idea of what a vector is, um, but <laughs> it's the funniest definition. They call it a vector a quantity, which to me it's not a quantity, but <laughs> it's more of a geometric idea. Um, but they say it's a quantity um, with both magnitude and direction. I think I'll close that door, hang on. Both magnitude and direction. Um, and uh, we graph graphically represent um, as what we call a directed line segment. Which of course is another way of saying an arrow. Okay. Um, so just uh, real quick. There you go, that's a vector. <laughs> so I might um, just give you some notation here. So if this point here is P and the end point is Q, then that vector could be called vector PQ. And here we would write PQ just as we do with a line segment, we do a line over it, but this time we'll put a barb over it like that. But more often we would write PQ and the barb looks more like sort of a hook like that. Okay. So it's not really an arrow when we use that symbol. Okay. Um, I could just as easily um, just call the vector with, uh, just identify it with one letter. So if I was to redraw this, maybe just over here a little, um, I could label it as V. Oops. And again, I would put a barb over it. Okay, so here I'm not specifying its endpoints. Okay. Um, in the, um, in general, textbooks um, represent vector letters in bold font without the barb above it. So in um, books, this is um, a bold font V, like kind of like, like this. Uh, with no barb above it. Okay, so that's that's standard. I've seen texts put barbs, but it's really unusual. Okay, and you, the art, the book we use doesn't, and it's just normal, just to use bold font. This is kind of confusing because I can't obviously I can't do bold fonts when I write my hand, but not. I don't know if that's obvious or not, but it's a little trickier. Okay, so let's start with the vector addition. Okay, so I'm just gonna have a, two vectors. One we'll call W, maybe like that. And then maybe another, I'll have it like that and let's make that, let's put too short. Let me make it a little longer there. So that one's going to be V. And geometrically, when we add vectors, we do, uh, we, we basically align the vectors tip 
to end. Okay, so mm, does that make sense? What's the tip? <laughs> uh, the tip and the end both sound like the same thing. I'm just going to let it go. I have no idea. So I'll do V plus W here. So this, that's V. And then I'm going to cop copy W over. And it has to go from the tip of, I have to align the tip of V with the end of W like that. And it, we think of this as two displacements. And um, so there's um, a person moving along V, they stop and then they move along W and then the net displacement we call a resultant vector. So this vector here, like that, is V plus W. Okay, and that's called the resultant. Or I'll usually just say the sum because nobody uses the word resultant. Just kind of nerds, you know. I, I can't bear the thought of people thinking I'm a nerd, so I'll call it the sum. And maybe it's worth um, also mentioning um, that if you add vectors, actually, let me just copy all of this here. Okay, one more picture, maybe like this. Um, what I want to do is just show that you can add in either order and you get the same resultant. Okay, so I'm going to put another W up here and then another V. And, and you can see that the net displacement is the same, which is to say that you get the same resultant. If you do V plus W or W plus V, this is W here and this is V. So going the high route, you do W plus V. And the point is to say that this is the same as going the low route and doing V plus W. Okay, so uh, we would say that in general, um, W plus V is equal to V plus W. Okay, any questions? Now, if I let's say I want to add a vector to itself, then that's just a little different if you if you think about it. So um, let's go ahead and do a copy of this is called scalar multiplication, by the way, and you'll see why. Scalar multiplication. I think I'll draw a line here to separate these. That did not work. There we go. Okay, so um, again, I'll take that W or the V is fine. So so put it down here. There's V. But I'm going to add another one. So there's another V. And of course, um, that result is 2V. So I'm just going to draw it right next to it here. So if you add V plus V, you get two V is the idea. And it's not hard to see uh, that two V 
points in the same direction. as v but is scaled to twice the length So two scales V by a factor of two. Ooh. Okay, so um, two is called a scalar and you wanna spell it scale er, but it's not spelled that way. Um, two is a scalar because it scales, but it just means scalar with like er, like it does the job of scaling. Um, and um, two v is a scalar multiplication. Okay, any questions? It is okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and do the zero vector. So I'll just say the zero vector is just a point. With no direction. and a zero magnitude. Okay. Any questions? Um, negative V is the vector, so this is just negatives. Well, maybe I'll say, uh, I don't wanna say negatives, I wanna say add it. <laughs> okay, so let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, okay, so the next thing is called additive inverse. <laughs> okay, so negative V is the vector that adds, to v to make zero. Um, and, and if we're going to line them end to end, um, they must have the same length but opposite directions because basically what we're saying is you're going out a certain distance and direction. And if you're going to come back to the original point, which is what the zero vector is, um, then you have to reverse the direction and go the same distance. Okay, so um, this means that um, negative V has the same magnitude uh, 
um, but opposite direction of V. So that's, I think that should sort of make sense. Um, and let's just kind of line them up end to end here. So here's V like that. And then I'll just sort of carefully, what I'm going to do is just copy that and change its color. And I'm pretending like I'm lining them up end to end. So this guy right here is negative V, right? And so if you go out V and you come back negative V, you'll, the resultant is, is, is the point, which is called the zero vector. So um, the picture is meant to make it clear that V plus negative V is zero. Okay. Um, negative two V uh, is the negative of two V. So uh, this means that it's it's twice as long as V, but opposite direction. So Okay, so KV um, scales V by a factor of absolute value of K, like that. Um, and Two cases, k um, greater than zero uh, means um, kv points in the same direction as v. Um, and of course, if k is negative, um, that means kv points in the opposite direction as v. Okay, um, I think that's all right. Let's go ahead and do subtraction real quick. Okay, so um, V minus W um, is just V plus negative W. <clears throat> okay, so that should be enough to make it clear what the geometry there is. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and copy my V and W from way back here. Here we go. I'll come back to this real quick. Okay, so here's V, there's W. Okay.
Now, I actually think I'll move W back so that it originates from the same point like this. Okay. And then what I want to do is I want to take that W vector and reverse its direction. So if you watch, um, I'm just going to copy W and make it negative W and apply it to the end of V. So notice I've reversed the direction here. I'll put a minus sign in front of it like that. So it sort of makes it a Z shape. And then let me change the color here to distinguish it from W. Okay. And then so V plus negative W would go this way. I'll do that in the third color. This one here would be V minus W. Okay, which is, if you like, V plus negative W. Okay, any questions there? Now, what you want to pick up from that diagram, um, hang on a sec. <laughs> is that this V minus W vector can be copied over here. Notice this right here works because this is a parallelogram. So over on the right, you again have V minus W. Um, so um, what I kind of feel like we should do then is just do this. This last picture here shows how vector subtraction works. Um, they, the V and W originate from the same point. I'll just say start at the same point. And V minus W goes from the tip of W to the tip of V. Um, any questions about that? Just go ahead and say it out loud if you have a question. And um, there's a parallel. Uh, professor. Yeah. Um, I don't have a question about this specifically. Uh -huh. I was just going to ask if this is going to be up on camera. Yeah, this will be posted. It's already there, but I just haven't published it yet. Okay, okay. Yeah, so no worries. I don't know. Notes will, all, notes will always get posted. Okay. Uh, I want to do one more diagram here. So what I'm going to do Wait. is... Was there more? Didn't sound like it. Okay, so I wanted to copy this diagram one more time. This sort of shows the geometry of addition and subtraction. We're going to make this into a parallelogram. Okay, so I'm going to do two copies of V, making opposite sides of the parallelogram. And two copies of W. Try 
try to align those like a parallelogram. So this is um, uh, <laughs> V over here and W down here. Let me move the other W out of the way. Like that. And what you have going downward in green is V minus W. I'll label that in a second, but the other diagonal of the parallelogram is V plus W. So they kind of all add up inside of a parallelogram this way. So again, in blue, this is V plus W. Okay. And the opposite diagonal um, is V minus W. And you just have to remind yourself, it sort of goes in the opposite of W. V minus W doesn't go from V to W. It goes from W to V. And it's sort of in the opposite order. Does that make sense? V minus W goes from W to V. If you can remember that, that will help. Okay, so this is addition and subtraction in one, one diagram. Any questions? How are we doing for time? Eight, eighteen. Let me check one more thing. I'm gonna. I'm looking to see how we're doing here. I don't know. Uh, this is the first week, and this week I'm supposed to cover three sections. So we don't need to completely get through 12.2. If we got halfway through, we'd be good. Um, for this one, we have to do dot products. So um, yeah, so we ha we still have 15 minutes, and I don't think we should waste it. There's just these are big. Uh, it's a big rush in the beginning just to get all these vector ideas down. Okay, but this whole first part is just so you understand the geometry behind all of this. Um, we got subtraction, we've got addition, we've got negation, we've got zero, and we have scalar multiplication. So I think we're good. So we're going to do um, now sort of coordinate. Uh, vectors with coordinates, and they call that vector components. And this is when the we start using numbers to describe vectors. Okay. So now a coordinate system. That isn't that right? There we go. So we'll start in two dimensions. So this will be my Y and an X. Two dimensional here. Three dimensional is just a lot more work. Okay, so uh, I'll have a V coming up to one, three, I think. Okay. And a W is going to go out to four, two. One, two, three. Where is it? One, two, three, four, two. That's W right there. Okay. So um, I'm using component notation. Um, v and W below are um, expressed as um, V because it starts at the origin and it terminates at the point one three. We just say it's the terminal point one three. 
So it has a horizontal component of one and a vertical component of three, and that's just like a point. So uh, the difference between a position vector, a vector that gives a position in the plane or in space, and a point in space, these are just, the distinctions aren't that important. We think of vectors as displacements. We think of points as positions. Um, but later on, we won't even make that distinct distinction. A vector will be a position later. So positions are points, and position vectors can be thought of as points as well. Okay, not just as I can't tell if someone's asking a question. So um, W is four two here because it goes it has a horizontal component of one, two, three, four, and a vertical component of two. Okay, and then it's easy enough um, to add um, V plus W by just copying W down here and lining up end to end. And notice a vector doesn't change its name just because you moved it. It's still W. Uh, I may write it in a different color here, but it's still W. Okay, and then um, so what you want to do is just kind of look at the resultant. Remember, that's that's another word way of saying the sum. So you can see it here. This is in blue. This is v plus w. Okay, and what are the coordinates? Well, v plus w. Let's see if we can mark down. This is a one, two, three, four. This is five. And one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's five also. So V plus W is five, five. Okay, and so what you want to just kind of note is the obvious, and that's sort of coming down below um, V plus W is um, one, three plus uh, four, two. And, and you can see um, that what's happened is that the X components add, because you're just adding the horizontal parts of the vectors, one plus four, and the vertical parts of the vectors, three plus two, to get the resultant, which was five, five. Okay. And uh, likewise, and I'm not going to bother graphing this because it's sort of obvious. Um, v minus W um, is um, one, three, minus four, two. And you just subtract component wise. So you'll do um, one, four, one minus four and uh, three minus two. So here you'll get um, negative three, one. Okay, and so you can do that a couple of different ways. Um, um, maybe just as a quick scribble on this, just to kind of solidify the idea. Um, I'm just going to move this down a skosh. So if I take my x axis and I go back to, to negative three here, and then up one, this is my v minus one vector, or sorry, my v minus w vector. So going, uh, I need another color. So let me do it in some horrible color like purple. Okay, so this one right here is V minus W. And it shouldn't um, surprise you that if I lasso that and copy it over here, it lines from W to V, see? But it's starting to make the picture a little crowded. So I almost feel like it doesn't help, but it's important that you see these still go. 
Okay, so you see that parallelogram with V minus W and V plus W. So maybe, maybe what I would do is just a little cleanup work so that it's more legible. So what I'll do I'll, is I'll just draw a little kind of an arrow to that and say that that guy is V minus W. Okay. And you can see it's still negative three, one. It goes three to the left and up one. Okay, so it's still it's still that same vector, but it's position, you know, vectors, vectors can be placed anywhere and there that doesn't change what they are. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, you know, maybe uh, what's what's room? Maybe I'll do it just to put a 2V up here and just to wrap this up. Um, also, um, 2V, if you draw it, um, I'm going to try and offset this a little bit, but um, it's this green thing, but I'm going to move it a little bit over to the side so it doesn't squish V. That's all right, I guess. I guess. Okay, so that guy right there is going up to this point right there. So this is 2v. And you can see by the coordinates that it, 2v is 2, 6. So clearly, when we do 2v, this is um, um, 2 times whatever v was, which is um, 1, 3. And you can see that um, what's happening here is you get 2, 6. So the 2 is just doubling the x component and the y component. So really, what's happening is it's just a 2 times 1, comma, a 2 times 3. So the scalar distributes through the vector. <clears throat> I don't want to say it's a technical distributes because um, this is not really the distributive property. Um, but that's how it works. Um, if I was to describe the, the addition, um, I'd say addition. Um, is what we call component-wise. Okay, let me clear out that negative three is not necessary. So meaning we add the X components and we add the Y components. And I would say the same thing down here with this subtraction, that subtraction is component-wise. Just the x component, and again, that just means you subtract the x's, you subtract the y's, it's done component-wise. Okay, but scalar multiplication is done like a distributive property. It distributes across the vector. Okay, how are we doing? 8.30? Um, Let's do one three dimensional vector. Um, so I have to do a three D coordinate system. We're just going to do one three D vector. So in um, three dimensions, um, you know. It, you could take those pictures that we drew before and draw that draw that same parallel a pipe head. And 
And that's kind of what you sort of have to do when you draw um, points in three-dimensional space. There's always this parallel pied that needs to kind of be drawn. Uh, it's just, it's a little bit of work. I'm thinking, let's see here. That's okay. And oops, I lost my one of my axes. There we go. Okay. Now we can oops, we can make one of those. And put it up here. Oops, that did not work. There we go. Okay, so maybe I would draw my uh, little vector in here, right to there, like that. And so this might be a V, like that. And if this point is A, and this is B, and up here is C, then we would say that V just has those components, A, B, C. Okay. Um, I'm not going to draw W, but if um, W is um, DEF, um, then how are we doing? 834. Okay, let's wrap, th wrap this up. Uh, v plus W. V minus W and then K V is what I need to write down real quick here. And we'll call it a day. Okay, so again, you add component wise. So X is add, Y is add, and Z is add. Same with subtraction. Like that. Now subtraction, we, we subtract component wise. Obviously. And then scalar multiplication, the scalar distributes across the vector. So we're going to have a Ka, Kb, and a Kc. So that's just sort of the algebra behind this. All right, so this is a quick summary of vector magnitude. Just a straightforward formula with our example. Now, um, we have to talk with, after talking about um, vector magnitude, we've got to talk about unit vectors. Um, these are straightforward. They have length one. 
um, and uh, we use um, hats notation um, for these, um, not barbs. Okay, so, you know, if I do U with a hat, this is a unit vector. Uh, if I you do you with a barb, <laughs> this is not a unit vector. So this is just notation. Okay. I'm not really uptight about this, but some of the teachers are pretty adamant. <laughs> and maybe it's worth noting um, that um, for any vector, um, V not equal to zero vector. Um, if you do um, V over the magnitude of V um, is a unit vector. Now that's hard, not hard to prove, um, but I'll, I'll uh, leave it to you if you want to play with around with trying to prove that. So um, for uh, V equal um, negative 263, um, the magnitude of V was 7. So you, I'll put a hat on it, um, would be V over the magnitude of V. Okay, so this would be a negative two, six, three divided by seven. So that's a, essentially a scalar multiplication. Technically, you're multiplying by a seventh. Um, but of course, the result is negative two sevenths, uh, six sevenths, and three sevenths. Uh, and it's easy to check. Um, that the magnitude of U is one as required. Um, and it maybe should be noted that um, U points in the same direction as V. Um, but has unit length. Okay. Are there any questions? I'm going to put the properties of vector algebra down. I'll, I'll take a look at this and make sure I don't want to, I don't know if I want to prove any of this or not. They're not hard to prove. It's a little tedious sometimes. And we've defined addition, subtraction, um, scalar multiplication. We define the zero vector. We defined additive inverse, all these algebraic ideas. Um, we'd like to be able to do algebra with vectors. So what are the things you can do is kind of the idea. So um, just a list. So 
So that's a, what's called a commutative property. Okay. Um, next is associative. So the grouping, it basically says it doesn't matter what order you add in. Um, you can order, you can add the first two first or the second two first. Okay, so that's called associative. Um, zero vector. Okay, so any vector. plus the zero vector is the vector that you started with, V. Okay, that's for all V. Okay, and that's called additive identity. That is zero is what's called the additive identity. Um, adding a zero just returns the identity of the original vector. Um, for this is additive inverse of vector plus its negative. We've defined this before. Gives the additive identity zero. Okay, so that one's called um, additive inverse. Okay, five. There's a uh, two distributive properties because there's two multiplication. Well, hmm. there's two additions. There's vector addition and there's scalar addition. And so that implies two different scalar, oh, sorry, two different uh, distributive properties. So it could be like a scalar C times V plus W. You can, dis you can distribute that way. And of course you get it just distributes across like you'd expect. But then you can also not not adding scalars. You can add vectors. So you could have like a C plus D times V. And we're here. We'd say, well, um, the V can distribute backward through this. So you'd have a C V plus D V. Okay. So it's two different distributive properties. Um, and then there's one more, which is the multiplicative identity. No, I take it back. There's two more. There's another associative. This is for scalar multiplication. So this is easy. It just says C D times V is C times D V. So that's, it's just a question of grouping again, but now it's with scalar multiplication. Okay, now this time I promise it's the last one. Um, it's just the multiplicative identity. One times a vector is the vector. Ta -da! So that one again is called multi multiplicative identity. Okay. Is number seven also multiplicative identity? No, I'm sorry, that one's associative. Thank you. Associative is always a way of saying you can regroup with your parentheses. And that's all you see there. And things are associated differently when you regroup. Um, okay, okay, so that, that's it. You missed something yes, sorry. Number eight. Could you say that again? Yeah, you you write uh, number eight, the uh, uh, magnitude of uh, vector V. No, that's one times V. That's the scalar one. I mean, Maybe one oh, number one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I'll write it so it looks a little more like a one. 
So just if you multiply a vector by one, it doesn't change the vector. That's all. That's all it says. These are obvious, I think, almost all of a bit. But um, you know, we're creating a new algebra, so it needs its own set of rules. The rules are obvious, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't state them, right? Um, we're going to do standard basis vectors next. This is more important than all these rules that we just put down. Okay, so um, this we're going to do two dimensional. Okay, so the um, basically the vector i with a hat is a unit vector because it's got a hat. So this is just one comma zero, and then j with a hat is also a unit vector. And of course, that's zero, one. Okay. So um, just real quick, let's do a little diagram here. And I think I'll put a, my I hat and my J hat on here just for the heck of it. Oops, didn't mean to do that. I want to fix it. <laughs> I wonder if I can make that smaller. I want to make my arrowhead smaller than that, but I don't know if it'll let me. That's okay. So that's I hat. And then I'll do J hat. I don't think, I don't know, maybe I should scale this up. Let's do this. That's too much. <laughs> okay, that'll work. Okay, so that guy right there is I hat. And over here is J hat. Okay. And then um, if I wanted to do another vector like, um, and I'm going to extend my axes a little more. Forgive me for a second here while I stretch this out. I wasn't prepared for going to a larger scale, but now I've done it. Okay, so then what I want to do is put another vector out here. Um, like, oop, like that one. <laughs> but maybe I'll do a barb on the end. There we go. Okay, so um, basically what I want to do is just represent this as the sum of multiples of i plus multiples of j. So probably what I would do to make that happen is do 3i. And I think I want to copy my i. I wonder if it'll let me. Thank you. 
It didn't work. Okay, so um, the, what we want to get here is that this vector that I started off with, um, which we would have written, um, you know, using just standard uh, component notation, the vector would be three comma two, but we want to just make sure that we understand that's the same thing as writing three i plus two j. Okay, this is um, what I would call component notation or component form maybe. And then this is using uh, standard ij vectors. I'll just call it ij form. And, and they're equivalent. So um, in general, Um, the vector a, b, it can be written as a, i plus b, j. Okay. And I hate that notation. I hate the i, j, k notation. So you won't, you won't see me use it much unless um, it comes up in the textbook or something like that. Um, and there are a few cases where it's convenient. Mostly it's convenient when you do a cross product. Real quick, in this example, where'd you get the two and the three from? Oh, I just... Uh, you, you just made it up? Yeah, no, this is just me expressing a vector in component form using ij not notation. So this is just a random choice that I did. Uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I just want to show you that we can break these down this way. Okay, um, the, uh, the component form with the three comma two, it takes less writing. So that's what I'll prefer, but but I understand your physics teachers will write three i plus two j, and so you you're welcome to use either form that you like, but in your mind obviously you'll need to be able to go from one to the other, and in math um, it doesn't take long in linear algebra which would be your next semester or some of you guys might be taking linear algebra now. Um, but it doesn't take long in linear algebra before we start wanting to have um, vectors of dimension higher than three. So, um, you know, you can have a four dimensional or five dimensional vector, uh, but it's easy to express a four dimensional vector, right? X, Y, Z, T, that's easy in component form. Okay. But, but you're not going to be able to use an I, J, K notation because there's just three there, right? So, um, so mathematicians who routinely work in dimensions higher than three um, will tend to favor the component form because it's more useful in that regard. Um, yeah, in statistics, a vector is a data set. So um, <laughs> if you've got a data set with 100,000 points in it, um, then that's a that's a 100,000 dimensional vector as far as the math is concerned because they use linear algebra to do statistics when it gets advanced. So vectors can be any dimensional, um, but in physics, obviously, well, uh, those are, when you get into relativity, you do four dimensional stuff because the time is the fourth dimension. Okay. Um, So I got that. Um, so in 3D, 
Um, then it's the same thing, I, I, J, but now we also have a K, right? And so those are one, zero, zero, um, zero, one, zero, and zero, zero, one. And, and if V is ABC in component form, then it's not hard to see that this is AI plus BJ plus CK. Okay, so that's, um, I don't need to go much further than that. Just the point is that you can express it either way. Both are legitimate. And um, I need to do um, a physics problem with you guys. So um, let me, uh, before I get too deep in, let's just do, do the sine, um, the cosine uh, sine representations. Okay, so, and then once you do the cosine and sine stuff, then you're ready to do your physics problem. Um, so obviously if V is any vector, um, let's say let um, script V be the magnitude of V. Okay, um, so um, you'll be able to, you know, let, let's just draw a picture of this. So the length of this vector is script V, like that. And probably you'd represent a, a little triangle here. Um, so let me get a little triangle going here. Like this and like this. So we'll have an angle of inclination for this vector. So the angle would be theta. And this is basically polar coordinate form for a vector. And just doing, um, uh, basic trig, uh, the, the opposite side would be script V sine theta here, and the adjacent side would be script V cos theta. Okay, so um, the, the, the way to finish the statement is that we can say, so, um, no, um, the vector V can be written this way, script V cos theta, script V sine theta, okay? And whenever you do the physics problems, you're generally, they're gonna give you these angles, whatever the angles of inclination are. And once you have these angles, or you'll be able to figure out the angles, um, they don't often tell you the vectors in their component forms. So it's your job to, to use the angle that they give. And maybe the magnitudes of the vectors, it's hard to say what all they'll give you. But um, in the end, you'll need to use this way of breaking the vector into components. Okay. Any questions about that part before we do a quick example? I should say uh, maybe a list of vectors that we'll see in class. Okay. Um, so the physical ideas will be um, position 
and displacement. Now displacement, it's easy to think of as a vector. You move from one place to another, and that kind of creates a directed line segment. Position is usually thought of as a point, but a position vector can also be thought of as a point, which is the end point of a vector that comes from the, that starts at the origin, okay? So position and displacement are both really um, position vectors, okay? Um, then the velocity vector, okay? Then the acceleration vector, and then mass times acceleration is a force vector, right? And anybody know what mass times velocity is? Which in velocity is a vector. So what's mass times a velocity vector? Momentum. Good, momentum. Okay. Um, there's also a vector called torque, which is a mass times angular um, acceleration. So it's a rotational force. Um, can you guys think of any others? These are the ones I routinely use in this class. And you'll see us computing all of these as we go. But boy, I'm not thinking of any others right now. <laughs> I mean, um, field vectors. So you can have um, electric fields and magnetic fields. Is impulse a vector? But impulse is sort of a force. Am I wrong, Wesley? Isn't impulse like an instantaneous force? So I see you have a question mark after yours. So we're gonna. I'm gonna leave that as a question mark. Basically, all of physics two ag. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I was, I had one, I was gonna say electric fields and gravitational fields, but of course those electric and gravitational, those are accelerations or forces. Um, and I also mentioned magnetic, that's also an acceleration or a force depending on um, whether it's being applied to something. Um, it's a force, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, no, but it has direction, right, Wesley? We're going back to impulse. So impulses definitely have direction associated with them. So I think that they're sort of like these super <laughs> instantaneous forces, right? Okay, so the point is, um, there are all kinds of crazy problems. Um, that they can give you. I want to go ahead and show you one of the harder things, one of the things I hated in college, um, and that was a uh, forces in equilibrium. And this will be the last problem we do in this section. Equilibrium. Hated them. Don't know why. I just, I don't know. I came in a little raw into my physics without having maybe prepared all the math background that I needed. Um, so this, some of these things just blew my mind. They're, they're not hard now, they're sort of tedious. They're annoyingly tedious. So forces of equilibrium, basically um, objects are not moving Um, even though forces are, are applied. Let's just say they are under, they are experiencing force. I mean, if you're sitting still in your chair, then you are in equilibrium. And you are and you are experiencing forces on you. Okay. This, of course, gravity, the force due to gravity is on you, weighing you down. 
um, that's one force. And we'd say if, if the floor wasn't pushing back, you'd fall right through it. So the force is pushing back on you with an equal and opposite magnitude. And it has to, or, or you wouldn't, <laughs> if it wasn't canceling out the gravitational force, you'd fall through the floor. So the bottom line is, is that when you sum up all the forces on, a, on an object that's not moving, they have to add up to zero. So the, the total of the force vectors Um, has to be a zero vector, okay, zero vector, not a zero scalar, okay, um, and again, this is a uh, forces uh, on an object in equilibrium. Oops. And so I know a lot of you guys have worked problems like this, so I apologize. Um, let's go ahead and um, do one anyway. <laughs> okay, so I, I just remember hating these problems, absolutely hating them. So this is a mass and let's give it 50 kilograms. Uh, do I want to do kilograms or pounds? Pounds. So this guy is 50, ooh, 50 pounds. Okay. And we have to be careful um, in, um, for forces um, in, in metric, um, you have to do um, um, mass times acceleration. So mass times acceleration. Okay, the mass would be in kilograms and the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. That's gravity. Uh, da, 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 da. That's um, this is this is force due to gravity. Forgive me. Okay. And in imperial units, um, just two pounds. Okay, <laughs> there's no computation. You don't have to multiply by gravity with imperial units. Okay. So that's why I'm using pounds. It's just, I like them better because they're easier. All right, so here's some angles. So this guy right up here is a 25 degree angle. And over here is a 40 degree angle. Okay. Um, there are tensions. Now you have to think of this object is not falling. Okay, we, we are aware that the weight of the object is pulling downward, okay? So there's a downward force here. I think I'll do a different color on that, the, which is just due to gravity. Okay, so on this thing, we've got this downward force, okay? But right now you have to recognize also that there are upward forces as well. So pulling up, let me do a thicker pencil here. Again, if these ropes don't pull up, then the object just, the object just falls. Okay, so I'm going to call these two vectors T1 
for tension one and T two for tension two. And this down, pulling downward is just going to be W, which is just the weight, okay, which is the gravitational force on this object, okay. And what we know is um, that T1 plus T2 plus W has to be zero, okay. Any questions? All right, so there's um, some, there are some unknowns here. Um, let me see if I've got the, any other information. I don't see any other info. Okay, so um, let's just go ahead and uh, break down. Uh, we wanna find, the magnitude of these tensions. Okay, and that's just the upward um, force that the ropes are pulling. Okay, you guys have any questions? Nope. Okay, and uh, uh, so what we probably need to do is break down these vectors in terms of their components. So um, let's do a little diagram with the three vectors here. So I'm just going to kind of copy them down. And I think I'll put my magnitudes up here. So this would be the magnitude of T1 here. And maybe I should make this larger. So I'm gonna scale this up a bit. Okay, and then maybe um, some reference angles. So how about if we do this? Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is just make triangles here. Like that. And uh, put down the angles that we know. So I know this right here, I believe, is going to be 40 degrees. There, and you just kind of have to do the math here. This is an alternate interior angle here. So this 40 degree here is the same as this 40 degree here. Okay, so um, I've got that. Okay, now the same thing is going to happen on this next one. So this is going to be 25 here. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and label a 25 degree right there. Okay. And I think what I want to do is um, come up with the full angle from the, the positive x-axis. So if I was to put this whole thing into standard position, um, 
let's see, I would have like a Y axis coming up here and an X axis going out this way. Okay. And so the first vector, I should say the second one's probably the easiest. So T2, uh, the vector is just going to be magnitude of T2 cosine theta. Well, for T2, theta is 40 degrees. And then magnitude of T2 sine theta, that is sine of 40 degrees. Okay. Now, if you want, you can use the reference angle for this, 25 for, for T1 or you can use the full angle. So the reference angle for T1 is 25 degrees, but the full angle for T1 is really 180 minus 25, which is 155 degrees. That's, oops, that's this angle going from the positive x-axis. So just to be sort of in, incredibly elementary, uh, I'm always going to use my standard angles from the positive x-axis. So uh, my T1, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is the magnitude of T1 um, cos 155 and magnitude of T1 sine 155. And I realize there's, you know, there's so many different ways to represent um, these things because of reference, you could you could express this all in terms of the cosine and the sine of 25 degrees. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sine of 155 will be the same as the sine of, of 25. Um, the cosine of 155 will come out um, negative. So you kind of have to do the negative um, cosine of 25 if you're going to use 25 on that. Okay, so anyway, and then we'll do the weight here. Let me do that last vector. Okay, we'll have that going down. Okay, so this is W. What's going on here? That's good. Okay, so W is, um, well, the zero on the X component, and I think it was a 50 pound, right? Yeah, 50 pound weight. So we just say zero 50 for W. Okay, and so we're to a point where I think shortly you'll see two equations and two unknowns. Okay, so... Um, we know that T1 plus T2 plus W will be zero. Some of these vectors, given that this is in equilibrium, nothing's moving. These have to add up to zero. Okay, so then we would just take these and add them up. Like that. So that's actually two equations. I'll go ahead and combine the vectors. So you get the bank two T1 um, cos 155 plus the magnitude of T2 sine 40, like that, plus zero, comma. <laughs> So that's the X components. And then the Y components, magnitude of T1 sine, oops, sine 155 degrees. Professor? Yeah. Is the negative, I mean, is the 50 for the weight supposed to be positive or should it be negative because it's pointing? Yeah, downwards? it should be negative. Yeah, thank you so much. Should be negative. 
I'll just put that in in green to make it stand out. So thanks for the catch. That vector should be negative 50. I don't know if I put it like that anywhere else. I don't think I did. So there's a minus sign there and of course a minus sign down below. I'll put a minus sign there as well. Okay, so then what we need to do is keep going. Um, so we got the magnitude of T2 sine 40. But now this one's going to have minus 50. Okay, and then this is equal to zero, zero. Professor? Yep. Um, T1 is T1's x direction is going negative. Shouldn't the x be negative or? Um, okay, this is uh, because I used 155 degrees. Oh, okay. in, in quadrant two, that the cosine will be negative. But we could use negative cosine the 25 instead. Is that yeah? And that's that what okay? I, I I had already said that. If okay, you want to use 25, mean. yeah, no, it's okay. If you want to use 25, you just have to remember to make it negative. You can, you can always use reference angles in trig. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And the, the reference angle is the angle between the vector and the x axis, whichever is closest, whichever, you know, the negative x or the positive x. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Professor, I think you miswrote one of the signs. Uh, Shouldn't it be T2 cosine 40 degrees plus zero? On the first component? No, on the second component. The, the like the second equation line where you got zero, let me, zero. Yeah, let me just uh, pause for a second and I'll find the mistake. Okay, so you're telling me that should be a cosine and not a sine. Uh, I'll do that in green also to make sure it's clear where I'm, what I'm changing. Is that it? Yeah. So cos 40. That looks good. And then sine 1325, T2 sine 40, and then minus the 50. Yeah. OK. And so now you, I think you can see there's two equations and two unknowns here. So, um, you know, and that's not fun, but I think I would just grab these by copying and pasting down so I don't have to rewrite them. I know that you can't do that. I'm sorry. And this has got to be equal to zero, which is on the, which is the X component on the other side. And of course the second equation, I'll grab the second component. Like this. And instead of saying minus 50 equals zero, let's just say it's equal to 50. Okay, now I think probably um, it's going to be easiest to work with the first equation because the zero is just nicer. Um, so for example, um, we could solve for um, the magnitude of T2 here. So the magnitude of T2 um, would be negative magnitude of T1 um, cos 155 over um, 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 cosine of 40. Like that. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then unfortunately, you need to plug that into the second equation here. Okay. And you'll notice there'll be a T, two occurrences of T1 that you can factor out there. So it's, it looks bad, but oh, it is bad actually, but magnitude of T1 um, sine 
155 plus magnitude of T2, which I'm going to replace. So this is going to be a minus actually. So minus magnitude of T2 is going to be the magnitude of T1, um, cos 155 degrees um, over cosine 40 degrees. And then that gets multiplied by sine of 40 degrees, and this is equal to 50. <laughs> Okay, so this whole part right here is the magnitude of T2. You see, I'm, I'm avoiding using my calculator until, I don't know, I don't like calculators, I guess. Okay, but this is now to a point where it's actually pretty easy to factor out um, T1. So, Magnitude of T1. So I probably would do that. Factor out magnitude of T1. And then inside you get the sine of 155 degrees minus, I'm going to write cos 155. And then I see sine of 40 over cosine 40. So I'm going to write that as a tan of 40. Like that equals 50. So now we can say the magnitude of T1 is 50 over that other mess. Okay, and um, so you can run the, <laughs> run the numbers on that. So that's T1. So I got 42.3 pounds. Okay, and then taking T2 here and just evaluate, because at this point we know what the magnitude of T1 is. So from there, you can see the magnitude of T2 is um, exactly 50 pounds, which to me is crazy because that's the weight of the, of the object that these things are holding up. <laughs> so the individual tensions add up actually to a lot more than the weight that, uh, that they're holding. How can that possibly be, you guys? Can you can you explain this for me? Because it's losing some of the holding, like the I guess the the holding force or the pull, like in the x directions. Yeah, yeah. The the if you think about the x components of these two vectors, they're actually pretty big and they cancel each other out because it's in equilibrium. So there's actually a whole lot of force that's being wasted in the horizontal component because you have to just remember the only thing that's holding this weight up is really the vertical components of the vectors and the horizontal components just have to cancel out. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot more force here than 50 pounds because it's really wasted force. Um, just due to the, the, the fact that there's a lot of um, pulling horizontally in opposite directions. Okay, is that all right, you guys? 